A very good evening and welcome to a brand new edition of News First Weekend coming to you live from our News First studios in Colombo. I'm Arundhati Mudanayaka. Let's start off with a look at the stories making headlines this evening. Navy personnel who go on retirement to be provided an opportunity to join the state sector. President says in Trincomalee. The Prime Minister extends a challenge to the former President. <laughs> Will part to crisis. Kallaru forest land State Minister of Defence Tuan Vijay Warden says that drug dealers will not be allowed to submit their names for nominations. <laughs> President Maitri Pala Sirisena says that a programme will be formulated which will enable members of the Sri Lanka Navy who are retiring from the force to enter the state service if they wish to. The President made this statement while addressing an event held at the Trincomalee Eastern Command Naval Base yesterday. President Sirisena, who arrived at the Trincomalee Eastern Command Naval Base, was accorded a naval salutation upon his arrival. The newly constructed Oceanography Faculty building at the Naval Base was declared open by the President. <laughs> When taking into account the information that we have received from our intelligence services on the drug menace, which has become a very severe national tragedy in the country, which has in turn come to light to society through the media, and based on the responses given by the youth, parents and children of the society, it could be understood that the issue of drugs and other intoxicant pills has caused major harm to the country. And you, who are serving in the Navy, should make it your utmost duty to prevent drugs from entering the country in order to eradicate and wipe out this issue from the country. But I do know that you are already carrying out this duty. Subsequently, Navy Commander Vice Admiral Jayanta Purira presented a celebratory plaque to the President. Thereafter, a tree sapling was planted in the premises of the Naval Base, marking the President's visit. A repaired vessel set sail under the auspices of President Maitripala Sirisena at the Naval Dock. President Sirisena thereafter engaged in a relaxed moment with the naval officers. The President's media unit said that the President visited the Koneshwaram Kovil in Trincomalee and received blessings. President Sirisena also visited the Nilavali beach in Trincomalee and engaged in a cordial discussion with those at the beach. <laughs> Will former President Mahindraj Paksa contest at the upcoming general elections? According to the National Freedom Front, the former president will contest at the next election. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister challenged former President Roger Paksa to contest the polls, if possible. However, the former president refrained from making a statement in this regard. I do not know whether former president Mahindra Rajapaksa will come forward to fight or run away. I make a request from him to come forward as a prime ministerial candidate. If you are scared, stay at home. We defeated the Rajapaksa regime at the last time. This time we will bury the Rajapaksa regime. Come for the fight. We have no objection to it. We are ready to fight. Please tell us who would be in charge of white vans in the next government, who would engage in thievery, who would bring down ethanol, who will be the drug dealers.
we would be pleased if both factions unite. The country will be able to see how the Rajapaksa regime governed this country, how they influenced the legal system, how they promoted corruption and thievery. The country will be granted an opportunity to choose. Water and oil cannot be mixed. Maitri Palasi Sena came out risking his life to make a difference and a union of the two will never happen. Abasan Tirne Ganenoa, Susil Premedant, Sandani, Mahale Kamtuma, Medinavala, Vidisagatavini. The final decision will be made by Susil Premajanta, the General Secretary of the Alliance. He is currently overseas for an education matter of his daughter. He is due to arrive soon. Upon his arrival, he will be taking the final decision. One thing is abundantly clear Mahindra Rajapaksa will contest at the general election. Komat Ekadia Pahadili, Mahindra Rajapaksa, Mahamati Gurneta, Tarankarma. Kisima Prasnak Napita Salasuma A Tieno, Salasuma B Tieno B B Vada Hondo in Napulo Apikino, then Saturn at in, then Apat Aranji. We say come to the fight. We have heard that both parties are going to join and come forward to fight. It would be much easier if it is so. All those who voted for the Swan can cast their vote to the UNP instead of placing their vote for the Beat Leap and establish good governance in the country. Even if Mahindra Raj Paksa contested separately, we will not have a problem. <laughs> There is a group that does not endorse the two groups joining, and they too will join hands with the UNP. Sources leaking detailed information to the Sunday Island, as claimed by the newspaper, indicate the damaging information and evidence exists to induct the current central bank governor in the central bank bond fiasco. The Sunday Island today reports quoting sources familiar with the court process that a special parliamentary investigation committee that probed the alleged insider trading and favoritism in a recent mega treasury bond issue has established central bank governor Arjun Mahendran's direct intervention on behalf of his son-in-law Arjun Aloysius owned perpetual treasuries. The 13-member committee named by Speaker Chamal Rajapaksa has obtained direct documentary as well as circumstantial evidence to prove Mahendran's role in the flawed process. The entire investigation took place in the presence of the Auditor General to ensure legitimacy to the process at the highest level. The Sunday Island reports that the Auditor General is expected to prepare his own report on the parliamentary investigation. The committee questioned both Mahendran and Aloysius regarding the alleged scam Parliamentary sources had told the Sunday Island, adding that the Bank of Ceylon facilitated the investigation by furnishing records of telephone conversations to the probe team. The Sunday Island published today notes that the committee went to the extent of playing telephone conversations on several occasions, much to the embarrassment of some of those who appeared before the committee, as well as some members of the committee itself. The committee also received documentary evidence to establish that Mahendran, contrary to specific regulations, had entered to the public debt department during the auction. The senior officials present at the public debt department at the time of Mahendran's intervention had confirmed this. The subject of the probe was a 30-year bond auction for rupees 1 billion on February 24th. The central bank received 36 offers amounting to rupees 20 billion. This had enabled the central bank governor to accept 10 billion rupees. A weekend newspaper reported earlier this year that the son-in-law of Arjun Mahendran, the governor of the central bank, was privy to information that the central bank had decided to accept bids up to 10 billion rupees instead of the initially indicated amount of 1 billion rupees, information that was not communicated to the primary dealers. However, in an article published on the Sunday Times website on the 6th of March, Arjun Mahendran was quoted as saying that his son-in-law was no longer a part of the firm Perpetual Treasury is limited. The website of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka lists 16 authorized primary dealers as of October 2013. And they are Bank of Ceylon, Capital Alliance, and Trust Securities, Commercial Bank, First Capital Treasuries, Acuity Securities, NatWealth Securities, NSB Fund Management, P 
पीपल्स बैंक संपत बैंक सिलान बैंक वेल्थ ट्रस्ट सिक्योरिटीज पैन एशिया बैंक कॉर्पोरेशन परपिचुअल ट्रेजरीज एच एस बी सी एंड द यूनियन बैंक On the 10th of March, news first reported on a press release issued by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka on the 9th of October 2013, announcing the appointment of Perpetual Treasuries Limited as an authorized primary dealer. The address listed on this document is Number 10, Alfred House Gardens, Colombo 3. The single shareholder of Perpetual Treasuries Limited is Perpetual Asset Management Private Limited. The listed address of the shareholder company is Level 3, Number 10, Alfred House Gardens, Colombo 3. News first secured a document listing the directors and shareholders of a company named Perpetual Capital Private Limited established on the 18th of February 2015 under the registration number PV 103925. The shareholders of this organization are Jeffrey Joseph Aloysius and Arjun Joseph Aloysius. The address listed is also level 3 Prince Alfred Tower number 10 Alfred House Gardens Colombo 3. Speaking to News First exclusively on the 16th of March, Governor Arjun Mahendran said that he takes full responsibility for not informing primary dealers regarding the increased bond requirement. But the problem right now, Mr. Governor, is the fact that this was not communicated to the primary dealers. Well, uh, it's uh, in the past it wasn't either. You know, the point is how can we communicate that to primary dealers because we didn't know that we would get 20 billion worth of orders. The moment we opened the bids, we realized that there was much in excess of what we had originally anticipated in the auction. But every time, Mr. Governor, there has been a treasury bond issue. There has been over subscription, right? Yes, but the point is, you know, we don't. Uh, the you see, my my point is the knowledge that I had that the government needed the money was in the back of my mind, and my expectation there was that we wouldn't have many bids at these auctions. So we were going to look at other means of raising it. So, Mr. Governor, there is a problem that persists with regard to the communication. I agree. I mean, it's because the functioning of the market has not been uh, perfect in the past. Now, in this instance, I think that uh, communication didn't work properly. We should have uh, said we needed to uh, raise 10 billion, but of course, we had advertised it the previous day, and I only got to know of the treasury requirement on the Thursday. So, there was this communication. I, I accept that. So, can this be called insider trading, uh, Mr. Governor? No, no, this is not insider trading at all. Because uh, you know, it, it was just a question of us shifting from one system to another. One organization in question was privy to information that the others did not have. No, no, that that has to be established. I, I certainly that information didn't come from me. Mr. Governor, many uh, primary dealers have told newspapers on the grounds of anonymity that this has uh, caused a confusion and instability in the market. And I think, as a governor, you should take responsibility for it. No, I mean, uh, I will take responsibility for the fact that we should have advertised 10 billion, but we didn't have that information in time. What is shocking about this whole matter is that the governor of the central bank, Arjun Mahendran, has admitted to News First that he made a mistake, that he failed to inform the primary dealers of the increase from 1 billion rupees to 10 billion rupees. Secondly. We have on record the chairman of the United National Party, Mr. Malik Samari Wickrama, who admitted that he was party, that he was present at the meeting that discussed these events, the need for money. It's highly unusual, but Mr. Malik Samari Wickrama said that he was there in his capacity as special advisor to the Prime Minister. We beg to differ with what he means. He seems to have no. specialist knowledge of central banking finance the losses calculated could be anywhere between 35 billion dollars and 52 billion dollars that's a substantial amount we could have built a hundred maragama cancer hospitals with that money it is very very clear that mr mahendran's position is untenable it is not too late he must go why is not the cop report being tabled in parliament is anyone exerting pressure on the committee members who is responsible for wasting public money to the attention of the public
Professor Rajiv Vijay Singh, uh, the COP committee report on the bond issue of the central bank uh, has currently been halted, but certain contents of it has been published in today's media. Perhaps I should highlight something that was mentioned in today's paper, which is in direct contrast to what seemed to have been said by the three-man committee appointed by the United National Party to look into this issue, which was that the governor had no direct involvement. It was very carefully put, as we know up to now, etc. But it's very clear that the government had a direct involvement. He has admitted it on television as well. And it primarily relates to his decision to move to a full auction system. But it's not a full auction system because they offered one billion and took 10 billion. So that was a distortion. And because of that distortion, the cost of the bonds, or many of them, was far below the real cost. So that whereas the early bids, and the bank usually takes only the, the, the better bids from its point of view, were willing to take 100 rupee bonds at 115, 119. The last few bids, including the bulk from perpetual treasuries, where son-in-law is involved, were at about 90 rupees. So there's a massive discount, which means they get a much higher interest rate. So what will happen in the COP committee report now? I do hope very much that the material, well, Sunday Handel has said it would come to light from today's island. Uh, I think uh, it's clear that some people have already made, feel their duty is to make it public. I've been asked for the report myself, the draft. I thought I should not give it. But I do not think it would be correct of me to hide everything myself. And I hope very much that the new parliament, if we actually get people committed to good governance, will appoint the new COP to look into this, to not to spend more time, but to go through the written evidence, it's all there in transcript, and issue the re draft report with adjustments if necessary as quickly as possible. Because we have to be saved from this appalling rise in interest rates that, you know, the UNP may think it's necessary. Mr. Vikramasinghe had apparently told the governor that the dealers were complaining. But when we checked, no one complained about dishonesty. But they obviously want high interest rates. That's natural in dealers. But as one deputy governor said, it is the business of the bank to discipline such dealers and make sure that the Sri Lankan people do not pay higher interest rates when you can get money at lower interest rates. Meanwhile, Deputy Minister Ran Vikramaratna urged the COP interim report to be made public. Even I was a member of the COP interim committee. Parliament was dissolved while the matter was being investigated. Due to this, the interim committee has not been able to reach a final decision. But I am going to make a request from Parliament that all the discussions and questions that we brought up during the COP committee meeting to be placed on record. I am also going to request that since we are transparent and have nothing to hide, that these reports be made public. Then the country will know that we have nothing to hide. Taking a look at our developing story for tonight, former Minister of Resettlement Gunarat Navirakon claims that he was unaware of people being resettled at the Kallaru Reserve bordering Virpato during his tenure as a subject minister. All the constructions were carried out by clearing this area of the reserve with the intervention of Minister Rishad Badiuddin. This seems to continue. This is a news for six posts compiled following a tour conducted by air. The destruction of the Vilpath Forest Reserve was a much discussed topic in Sri Lanka. The matter was discussed among society as well as in the political arena due to the destruction of the forest. News first took to the skies to look into the destruction caused. The Kallara Forest on the Marichukkade Karadikuli Wildlife Reserve located north of the Vilpath National Park is considered a forest ecosystem which has most significance to Vilpathu. Due to the land and reclamation that has been taking place since 2010, nearly 3,000 acres of land in this ecosystem is destroyed. The extent of the destruction could be seen by air.
Minister Rishad Badiuddin, who constantly stood firm on the belief that this is not harmful to the environment and that it is not illegal, made such a statement recently. You said that this was a sustained region, so on and so forth. It is with responsibility that I say that these villages are built in the area between Muttur and Shilawatura. It was registered in Kallaru in 1993. It has also been gazetted. However, survey plans which were declared in 1938 is testament that the statement made by the minister is false. According to these survey plans, resettlement in this area commences in 2010. Since then, the carnage that has befallen on this reserve took a new turn in 2013 with the intervention of Minister Badiuddin. That is through his letter issued by the Department of Wildlife on the 14th of February 2013. According to this letter, a land area of 1,080 acres in the Manor district belonging to the Department of Wildlife was released to resettle those displaced. Deforestation and resettlement has been carried out far exceeding the area of 1,080 acres to up to 3,000 acres. Moreover, another 500 acres of land within the reserve itself, but away from this reclaimed area, has been deforested. So when we filed the statements made by the locals, it was understood that this bit of land was being cleared for the personal need of Minister Richard Bathiodin. What is alarming is the fact that Gunaratha Virakun, who was the Minister of Resettlement during the time frame these lands were said to have been released by the Department of Wildlife, claims that he was unaware of this. I was not aware that these lands were released. Our ministry was not involved in it. After revelations made on the destruction caused, the President ordered that it be stopped immediately. The President ordered the Ministry of Environment that the matter be examined and a report submitted to him. As per the orders of the President, all acts of deforestation have been banned by the Ministry. A pre-report compiled by officials of the Department of Wildlife on the situation of another 2,850 acres of land which was released was submitted to me three to four days ago. But we are still studying the matter. So within the coming week, we hope to take the facts and details in that report into consideration and submit a final conclusion to the President. Today, news first inspected as to how deforestation of Kallor forest area continues despite the orders of the president. News first correspondent Nuranga Samar Singha, who went to the area today, was met by an organized group of people. I engaged in an inspection tour to witness the state that has befallen the Kalaru forest in the Wilpatu Reserve. The new resettlements that have taken place in the forest and the illegal deforestations and transportation of logs by unidentified individuals could be witnessed. When I was capturing this footage, seven unidentified individuals arrived on four motorbikes with no number plates on them and stole the memory card from my camera and fled. Should measures not be taken into such acts which harm the environment that are carried out devoid of the law, defying orders and obstructing the media? The Kalaru Forest is an area which was declared a forest reserve. Subsequent to it being declared a forest reserve, it is wrong for persons to enter this forest without permits, release lands, construct buildings without permits and occupying them temporarily or on a permanent basis. Thereby, an official of the Wildlife Conservation Department or a police officer can arrest individuals who have committed these crimes or is suspected of committing such crimes and produce them before courts. Is it not disappointing the extent politicians go to just to be in power by destroying the gifts of Mother Nature which have been providing us for thousands of years? The four suspects who were arrested for selling an expensive and a special variety of drug have been remanded until the 30th of this month. The suspects were remanded after being produced before the Malika Khan Magistrate's Court today. The raid was carried out last morning by officials attached to the Narcotics Bureau of the Excise Department. 48 tablets of an expensive and special variety drug, more commonly known as ecstasy, as well as two luxury vehicles were taken into custody by officials of the Excise Department. Excise officials said that a tablet of ecstasy was being sold at a price between 3,000 and 6,000 rupees per tablet. <laughs> All four suspects who were arrested are between the ages of 20 and 25. 
During interrogation, it was revealed that one of them served as a police constable. He was in possession of his official police identification. In addition to that, he carried an ID card of the Police Crimes Investigations Department. Information has come to light that ecstasy is being brought into Sri Lanka via the VIP lounge at the Katanayak International Airport. Excise department officials point out that foreigners who arrive in Sri Lanka to smuggle ecstasy into the country. Another channel of importing the drug is by making online orders. When importing this drug by placing orders online, the generic name of this drug is not used. Various brand names are used instead. The online orders are placed under these brand names and they arrive in the country through the post. Ecstasy which is brought into the country in this manner has made its way into the country's nightclubs and are becoming highly popular among the youth. Ecstasy is sold in nightclubs by using women. Unlike those who are addicted to heroin, it is difficult to identify the youth who are addicted to this drug. Most of those who have fallen victim to this drug are schoolgoers. Parents need to be watchful regarding their children's activities. Coming up on the news tonight. Organizers questioned over Taiwan water park in Furno. The number of people... With elections just around the corner, the public further expressed their want for a virtuous public representative in Parliament. Yeah. We kindly request that drug dealers, ethanol dealers and individuals who earn money through harmful trades not be given nominations. If we submit such names, then as a public we will take a decision accordingly and without hesitation. We will be compelled to cast our votes to political parties who have nominated virtuous individuals because the entire country has been waiting for a good society for a very long time now. We have been suffering for decades because we elected corrupt individuals and murderers to parliament. I would like to request from all our leaders not to allow individuals who are corrupt, who are involved in drugs and the marijuana trade to get their nomination for the upcoming elections. If such persons are elected, then as voters we would expect an answer. All parties must know that this opportunity should be given to good and educated individuals instead of giving it to those who are corrupt. If drug dealers and ethanol dealers submit their names for nominations, then the people will teach them a good lesson on election day. I wish to say that only accepted individuals in our area should be given the card. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, ethanol. The parliament has individuals who are ethanol dealers, drug dealers and even rapists. The people will teach them a good lesson in the future. Theater. If candidates are thugs, drug dealers, thieves, persons who have raped and who are involved in corrupt activities, then as voters, we will teach them a good lesson. There should not be ethanol dealers or drug dealers. If there are such persons, then we will make sure they learn a good lesson on election day. The people of the North place their signatures for the March 12th declaration, which includes guidelines that political parties need to consider when handing over nominations. The national program launched to obtain one million signatures for the March 12th declaration for clean politics commenced its journey from the Jaffna town today. Uh, in the Muyachi Vande, Arasiel Kajikadeke, Panapalatalim, Adihara Palatalim, the All of Raylam, Yanga Arasil, and the Pala Anatangal Karnam, and the Tresia Padenda Arasil Vadigal, Lanjam under the Ula Sigandra, Putavaril, and Hundred Dom, or the Matia Makavan or Muno Gil. The next stop of the rally, which passed Jaffna, was the Kilinochi bus stand, where signatures were obtained from the people for the March 12 declaration.
மக்களுக்கு ஒரு நல்ல எதிர்காலத்தையும் ஏற்படுத்த வேண்டும் எனவும் இன்னும் ஒரு புதிய பாராளுமன்ற உறுப்பினர்கள் தெரிவு செய்ய வேண்டும் நடக்க இருக்கும் தேர்தலில் நல்லாட்சிக்கான மக்களை தெரிவு செய்து இதுவரையில் கள்ளம் கபடம் செய்தவர்களை After obtaining signatures from Kilinochi the rally then reached Vaunia while obtaining signatures from the towns along the way people of Vaunia too made their contribution to the program to obtain 1 million signatures the program is initiative of 21 organizations including Papra Waves were expressed on the Salta the political program with regard to allowing the corrupt to submit their nominations in the upcoming elections We must introduce a program against thievery and corruption. A program needs to be introduced where the law will be enforced and guide the country on the right path. We will have to come to a clear decision with regard to drug rackets. How can we stop this menace? No one has been found guilty before the law. However the society is well aware on who brings down ethanol and who brings down drugs tell the truth do you know them I am not the general secretary of the party and I'm against this but remember if individuals like Chatura carries out raids in Sirikota and Dali road and if you carry out another raid in other areas you will find the same group of people at that location as well Now you all say not to give nominations to those involved in ethanol and drugs when you make such submissions you should also be able to tell the names of those involved if not we would not know who you are actually raiding naam kiri lagti hai no kiya na api api ana anivaryama naam karana hai kattiya kavadda obutumal loka naam karana nomination denna aave naha ni then nomination denna aave obutumal nomination denna isala kiyanne pen mokada nattak e gulan dannet nathu wenne kavuda kiyala ne aapu denko aapu denko obutumal la obutumal la e dawassai nana dan me kiyana vidiyata danne na dan me me mahanetuma danna hondata mahanetuma de viruddho e danne ona tara kiyathmaka una Today was day 2 of an educational exhibition organized at Independence Square in line with International Day Against Drug Abuse and Illicit Trafficking. State Minister of Defence Ron Vijay Wardena declared open the exhibition today which comprises of 40 stalls that raise awareness on the negative effects of drugs and medical treatment. At a time when parliament has been dissolved as a member of the United National Party and as a parliamentarian I would like to state that we would never love anyone from our party who has been involved in drugs to submit their nominations we do not need such individuals to represent the country's parliament it is not good to elect such persons as leaders of our society the United National Party has a firm decision on this Speaking at a function held in Hambanta today Minister of Housing and Samurdhi Sajid Premadas said that he will continue his program of providing relief to the poor regardless of any obstacle that comes his way Bahuge kale mantare wage japa kare havatta visruwan Since the recent past all that was said and asked like a prayer was when will parliament be dissolved why isn't it been dissolved now the main topic is who will be contesting this is all that is being said as of late my dear friends but does anyone think of the 3.5 million poor families in the country who does not have any support from anyone is anyone thinking about these families who suffer amidst all this talk at present the political system that operates in our country is a number one dual standard political system and an extremely cruel political system but no matter what people say as the person who is in charge of the 3.5 and low income families i will ensure that these people receive their relief benefits even if i have to end up in prison even if i have to be sent to the electric chair i will most certainly do what needs to be done for the poor abi laba denawa laba denawa e kantai kiyala man me avasthave prakash karana This function was organized for the commencement of reconstruction activities on the Alokopura Tsunami apartment complex in Hambantota being carried out by an authority which comes under the purview of the Ministry of Housing and Samurdhi Social media has transformed our world and the way we communicate. News First marks Social Media Day by providing a new experience to its loyal viewers in Point Pedro and Don Rahel. A workshop was held connecting Jafta Matra and the United States on one platform. 
The news first digital team organized two workshops in Mathura and Jaffna in line with Social Media Day. A workshop was held at the auditorium of the Mathura Post Office with the presence of a group of enthusiastic participants. The participants were informed about the use of social media and the pros and cons of new media. Representatives from several communication and technological institutions who partnered with News First were also present at the event. Former lecturer of Morito University, Gihan Fernando, was one of the guest speakers at the workshop. Writing about it with another person, maybe I'll think about it and try to be a better person. Another workshop was organized at the Ariyakulam Advanced Education Institution in Jaffna. The News First digital team kept the participants abreast on new media and its impacts towards society. One of the key highlights of the two workshops was an online lecture delivered by Dr. Bill Silcock, who is a lecturer at the Arizona State University in the United States of America. A big picture of a desert, which is where my wife and I were driving to take the desert quite a little because that's important. Our News First team were also able to educate the participants on the impact new media will make in the future. You fulfilled your responsibility towards society. Call Mathura Hamantata, who is the best you reporter. News First, you report to Regional Convention, Southern Province, on the 5th of July at the Mathura Cooperative Society Hall at 8.30 a.m. For more details, call us on 0114-896-896. This report was filed by News First U reporter Dimesh Adhikari from Volkhavela. A protest was held in the Pidruvalla area in Kurunagala this morning. Area residents demanded that the Pidruvalla and Hangwala road be renovated. They carried out the protest obstructing the Kurunagala Nigambo main road. News First U reporter win win. Mama Dimesh Adhikari, Volgahala City. And with that, we wrap up tonight's edition of News First Weekend. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a pleasant week ahead of you. Good night. <laughs>